Okay. You think the Lord Jesus Christ read that of himself? Do you know that? He read that of himself. That he was that one that would come. You know, when John the Baptist was there talking to, no doubt, a bunch of interested friends, perhaps, as some would say, the greatest orator of all time, John the Baptist, the voice that cries in the wilderness, the Lord Jesus Christ walked up across the hill and he stopped what he was saying and he pointed him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, come to take away the sins of the world. That Lamb there was right next to Adam and Eve, wasn't it? The moment that they transgressed against God. The plan from the foundation of the world. That man is who we consider tonight. Chapter 10 will blow you away. Interestingly enough, I want to tell you about that video. We were living in South Africa and we had a Passover weekend. So I decided we're going to make something for the Passover weekend to demonstrate to perhaps the young people uh, there what the process was. So I looked up and I found where to buy the lamb and I went <clears throat> and picked him out from a whole bunch up in the country. And over there, laws are a lot different than here. Um, it's against the law probably to do that here uh, and with uh, good reason. Over there, so you know that uh, that animal was eaten as part of the Passover. It was all done properly. The two um, men that were involved in the slaughter of the animal were butchers. So it was all done properly and humanely. But I took that lamb and dropped it off at the place where we were going to um, have this Passover feast and we were going to film it. And I dropped it off and when we began to film, I said to the boys, the, the two butchers, I said, lad, just, just do what you would do. Grab it, put it on the bench, prepare the animal and kill it. And do you know what? I couldn't help, I was shaking so much to watch what happened next because Isaiah 53 is in, the, in your mind. And the lamb led to a slaughter. Do you know what? That lamb did not do a thing. There is the slaughter table and two men with knives and the lamb came and stood next to it. Stood next to it, freely just standing there. And then they picked it up. And you saw in that video, they tied the hands together and the, the lamb looked up. It sat up and watched them tie its hands together like a lamb led to the slaughter. And they laid it down and held its neck and it didn't do anything. And when they cut through, the only sound, the only sound was the sound of its breath escaping its lung. And it was gone. Unbelievable. I tell you what, unbelievable. It's a fascinating experience and I do hope that you got something out of it. So we're going to jump into chapter 10 and chapter 10 is full of practical goodness. We're going to spend a bit of time going over practically what chapters 8 and 9 have given us, what it means to you now, what it means to us personally, ecclesial environment, what it means when we get out there. Right, this is what we've, we've got to take some practical stuff away. So I want you to follow along. Um, I hope we make it as simple as we can to understand. And do forgive me if I speed through some parts of it um, because time is of the essence. So chapter 10, verse 1. You're going to find from verse 1 through to about verse 16, we have a recap on chapters 8 and 9 on a lot of the things that we've considered You've got to take notice of the language in these chapters, right? When God writes through people in their own unique style, perhaps Paul on this occasion, he uses really, really specific language because he knows it pushes their buttons. He knows that it flags in their mind. He's trying to make a point all the time in this argument. So you have a look, for example, in verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image can never with those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. He's already said that thing back in chapter 9. He reiterates it and look at the language he uses. The law, 
a shadow, never, year by year, continually. Year by year, continually. What you just watched, they did year by year, continually. That's what the high priest had to do. Day in, day out, year by year, continually. And he's saying, that can't make you perfect. The repetition of the law could not make you perfect. He says, for then, would they have not ceased to have been offered? Right? So if it did work, wouldn't have only had to do it once if they did that very thing and it worked and it took away the sins of the people on the Day of Atonement forever? They would just have to do it once because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did, offered himself once. Ah, he tells you why it couldn't. Because that the worshippers once purged should have no conscience of these things, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance. Right? There's a remembrance. You look at, cast your eyes across to verse 17. In the new covenant, as spoken in Jeremiah 31, he says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's what happens for you and me, isn't it? We approach God through our Lord Jesus Christ who mediates on our behalf and we get forgiveness of our sins, don't we? We ask for the remission of our sins and Christ takes that and he goes and he places it to God and he explains how we're feeling. Why? Because he is like us, old flesh and blood, being tried in all points, just like you and me. And he puts it to God in such a way that he understands that we get forgiveness for that. You are clean. God remembers no more. Under the law, you were caused to remember all the time. If you had to do that every week, all it would remind you of is how bad a person you are. We already know that we fall short of the glory of God. And under the law, you were reminded constantly again and again and again. But that's not his point. He says that's the problem with those. Christ, that doesn't happen. Right? One sacrifice for all forever. And we get remission of sins. That's why we said this is a better covenant. You get your sins forgiven and you get to live forever. Verse 4, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away the sins, he says. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure... Lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written, to do thy will, free will. I come to do God's will. Do you know that that, what we just read, is a direct quote from Psalms chapter 40. I'll read it to you. Psalms 40 says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears thou hast opened, burnt offering and sin offering you have not required, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Remember Paul's point? He's saying it's got to be about your heart and your mind and your conscience. See what David says in Psalms? Your law is in my heart. There's a guy that gets it. It made it past this external, it made it past behavioural and it become about his life. Your life is Jesus Christ. We read that earlier. He is our life. It became a way of life. Not just something that was done externally, but it got in here. He says, your laws are written in my heart. I delight to do thy will. And what is the will of God? I'll tell you what, it's laid out and I'll read it for you. In fact, you can turn there. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And head to verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse 38. He says, For I am come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He's not doing what he wants. Right? He's there to do the Father's will. And he clarifies what that is. He says, And this is the Father's will which sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again of the last day. Even though I come and I am going to lose my life, he read that of himself. He knew he would offer his life. He says, I count it nothing because I know I'm going to be raised up again. 
He says in verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in that day. He came to do his Father's will, it says. Verse 8, above the, when he said, Sacrifice and burnt offering um, for sin thou wouldst not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the, the second. Isaiah 53. It pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God to bru bruise him. That was part of the plan. Right, that's how much he loves us. Now have a look at this in verse 11. And every priest standing, daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down on the right hand of God. There's that language warning again. Have a look at the two. Every priest stands, this man sits. He blatantly says it in the two verses. Every, every priest stands, this man sits. We heard that in our last talk together. Same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Verse 11. One sacrifice forever. Verse 12. And then he sits down. He's hammering home the point. Verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Do you see what he's trying to labour? He's trying to labour one sacrifice so that didn't need to happen all the time. Perpetual sacrifice, one of them, and it's forever. The old covenant is now waxing old and dying away. The New Testament, alive in Jesus Christ's blood and his offering. That's what he's trying to labour. And then he says in verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and minds will I write them. There's that reference again. Their sins I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of... Oh, uh, sorry, I'll start again. Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Recap. There it is. That's everything we talked about this afternoon. All bunched in. There's a few new points there. We're not going to do it right now. But there is our recap. And then verse 19. Now the practical stuff. Having therefore, he says, brethren... <coughs> excuse me. Boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus Christ. That word boldness there is liberty. The margin renders it as liberty, which is what? Freedom. Having the freedom to enter into, uh, having the freedom, it says, to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can do that any time. We spoke about that earlier through our prayer. You are free to do that, aren't you? Remember we're free? Remember we're sons and daughters? Do you know in Galatians 5 verse 1 it says this, one of my favourite quotes in Scripture. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, if I can find Galatians, there it is. Galatians 5 verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. The NIV translate it, For freedom you have been made free. Free to live abundantly. We need to get really used to that idea of freedom in our Lord Jesus Christ versus the slavery and darkness and shadow of the law. It could only point forward to freedom. You and I are free to go and talk to God and take our problems to God anytime we want through the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ and can we stop at this juncture and mention one thing? Do you remember it said in one of the verses that we looked at, and this is a, actually really, really uh, important. In, chapter, in verse, chapter 9, verse 14, we said, How much more shall the blood of Christ through the, eternal, through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from living works to serve the living God? Do you know what? God is the destination. Never forget that. We come in this whole book, this whole year, you've come to consider the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the redeem, to come and redeem those that were under the law, and rightly so. And we say that we come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and we talk about his sacrifice, and we talk about his love. We talk about all these things, and absolutely rightly so, we should do that. 
But never forget the destination is God. Never forget that the way was opened by Christ to God. We worship our God, not just the vehicle that gets us there. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? We don't just stop with the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches do that all the time, right? They do that all the time. They say, this is where it's at. It's all and only about Jesus Christ. And somehow God gets left out of the picture. Well, do you know what? He orchestrated the whole thing. From the, before the foundations of the world would, were laid, he knew that this would happen. He knew that he would have a son and he would offer his only son because he loved the world. He knew that. Our God is great and he is worthy of all praise that we can give him. He is our Father and we want to come unto him and we can do that through our Lord Jesus Christ. Never forget that God is the destination. So he says, having therefore the freedom to enter into the holiest by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, right? A new and a living way, not through the dead way, not through the old way. This is a new and living way, a constant living way, he says. And then we get to verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. He says, let us consider one another to good works unto love, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verses 21 through to verses 25 are a practical guide for you and me, both individually and as a group, as an ecclesia. Right? What you're about to read is sound advice. You have a look. Verse 21, having a high priest over the house of God, Christ, our high priest, over the ecclesia. Verse 22, let us draw near, he says, with, uh, with a true heart, a real heart, he says, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, right? not the external, having our hearts sprinkled, and um, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says, let us draw near. Do you know the step to drawing near to God? Right, because he's, he's suggesting that's what we need to do. Do you actually know the steps on how to do that? How do you draw near to God? It sounds kind of tricky. I'll tell, you who, I'll tell you who explained it absolutely perfectly, and that was James. I'm going to read you something. James 4 says this. He says, but he giveth... More grace, wherefore he said in verse 6, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He resists the proud, right? So when we say we can enter boldly into the holiest through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, does that mean of yourself? Boldly? That you can boldly walk in there? Proudly? And say, here I am? No way. He says the beginning of this Right? The beginning of drawing nigh unto God has to start with humility. It has to start with humbling yourself because if there's anything that God doesn't like, it's pride. Because if you've got any pride in you when it comes to this, it denotes the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Because if you even think just a little bit, I can do it even about this much, that takes that much away from the sacrifice that Christ gave. Do you see? takes a little bit away. So when you say, I can do nothing of myself, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, we're being humble. We say, I can't do anything. So in the first step in drawing nigh to God is humility. He says, then he says in verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Make yourself vulnerable. One of the toughest things that you will face in ecclesial life is making yourself vulnerable to other people. 100%. If it's hard to be humble, you wait until you make yourself vulnerable. Because when you make yourself vulnerable, you open yourself up immediately to other people's judgment, their comments, the way they perceive you. You know what James says in this book? 
James says in this book that you should confess your faults one to another. You try doing that sometime. Because the very first step in confessing your faults to someone else is one of you in that conversation makes themselves vulnerable first. Don't you? That's really tough to do. That's why he says do it. You want to know how much trust you've got in each other as brothers and sisters? We call each other brothers and sisters. I mean, if you really think that through the blood of Christ we are brothers and sisters, you sit down and make yourself vulnerable to someone else. And for that five seconds that they don't respond in you telling them that perhaps of a, a real private problem that you battle with, if they even wait for five seconds, it feels like five years because you sit there thinking to yourself, what are you thinking of me? I've just told you my darkest secret. You think I'm, I'm perverted. Do you think I'm weird? Do you think that oh, I'm dishonest? You know, you've got to learn, we've got to learn in Ecclesia life to make ourselves vulnerable to each other. So not only does it take you to make yourself vulnerable, but it takes the other party to not act in judgment. Right? So he says the final step, he says, number one, you humble yourself. Number two, you make yourself vulnerable. You submit yourselves to God, right? Because if there's one person that won't fail you, it's him. You make yourself vulnerable to God. He'll always do the right thing, always, because he goes along and says in verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I don't know what the picture of God, you've, your God, you've got in your head, but that changes everything for me. God drawing nigh to me, that is astounding. You know why? It's because he's your father. Your sons and daughters. And there's not a father on this planet that wouldn't want to come to their kids when they want to come to them. Not a father on the planet that wouldn't want to do that. He is no different to the father and son relationships you see in your own lives. That same almost inexplicable love you have for your offspring. If one day when you have uh, children or your brothers or your sisters, that same love, that's the love that God has for you. And remember we said that he can't make you do this. He can't make you do it. So when you want to do it, he's running at you. You go and read the prodigal son. You read that with this in mind and it will change your life. Because when that prodigal son had squandered his inheritance and he was standing there, he had nothing left in the world, what did he do? Number one, he recognised his position before his father and he said, I've done the wrong thing by my father. And number two, he says, I will go to him. They're the only two things he did. I've done this wrong and now I've got to go to him. And what happened? His father saw him away off and ran out there and hugged him ran the whole way down the driveway and just grabbed him because he was home, because he's family. But it took him to recognise his position before his father and it took him to take one step in the direction of going home. You do that in your life, one step. Don't ever think it's got to be giant steps. Don't ever think you've got to be sprinting down there. If all you can muster in your life, right, a, a, a grain, a mustard seed of faith, because that's what Christ would prefer, he said. Even if it's just that and you just take one step, you're moving. And in an instant, God covers the entire planet to get to you. 100%. Never forget, in drawing nigh to God, that he will draw nigh unto you, young people. Number one, with a true heart in full assurance, he says, of, our, of the faith. Number two, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast, he says. The profession of our faith, or uh, Elpis is the word, that's where Elpis Israel comes from, the profession of our hope, he says, without wavering for he is faithful. He is faithful that has promised. He promised to Abraham a very long time ago. Then he gave his son so that those promises might come to fruition. He is faithful, he says, hold fast. Have you ever seen a drawing or some really, really old photos of sailors? Sailors, typically, in the last hundred years, tattoos all over them. So if you, you, I did some reading on this, really fascinating. Sailors, when they crossed certain points of the earth, they would put a tattoo or marking on their body to say, so that you could actually read their backs or their arms or what have it, and it would tell you the story of where they'd been in the world. 
And typically, they would write on their knuckles, hold fast. And deckhands would do that. The deckhands would. Not everyone, just the guys that were out on the decks. And it had hold fast on here. Do you know why they did that? I, I just, it has nothing to do with this. It's very interesting. Hold fast. Do you know why they did it? Because these are the guys that would run up the masts and maintain all the sails. I don't know if you might have seen in a movie or something where a, a storm whips up on one of the tall ships, one of those real big ones with like four or five masts. You know those masts are 50 metres high? Gigantic, gigantic masts. And a storm would whip up. And so that the sails weren't destroyed and cut in the wind, these are the guys that would have to go out and go up there and then they go out across the beam, 25 or 30 metres out over the side of the ship, right? And the only thing that they hung on to was a piece of rope, one piece of rope. And they said, you must hold fast because it is for your life. Because if you fell off the edge, you were gone forever, down into the dark ocean. They couldn't turn around, get your 40, 50 foot swells. Hold fast, the old sailors used to say. And they would teach the young ones to hold onto that rope because it was for their life. I use that analogy because what we're talking about tonight and that sacrifice there, you hold fast. Our exhortation here is for us to hold fast. Paul is writing to the Hebrews and telling them, hang on to it. You've got it. Hang on to it, he says. And in verse 24... <clears throat> He says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Let us consider one another. Do you know what? Here's a little guide as to how we should be acting in this ecclesial environment. And it's taken out of 1 Thessalonians, and just let me read it to you. You have a listen. 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, we know that, who died for us, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. He says, wherefore then, comfort yourselves together. The word means exhort. Do what we're doing now. He said, exhort yourselves together and edify one another even as you do. You know what the word edify means? It means to build up or construct. He says, that's what you've got to do. You've got to build each other up and construct each other up. We're building, this is a construction, Right? You think in your life, are you offering edifying and constructive words to your brothers and sisters and to your friends in this place? Are we building people up? Or do we get on social media and build them down real quick? Because we can. Do you know what I mean? Do we talk about people? Are we, are we putting our energy into construction? He says, and we beseech you, brethren, in verse 12, to know them which labour amongst you to know each other. You're all working towards the same thing. Do you know everyone in this room? How well do you know the person sitting next to you? Do you know them well enough to call a brother and a sister? Do you know that person that well? Do you know them well enough to confess your faults to them? Do you know them well enough to make yourself vulnerable to them? Do you know why all of this is really important? I'm going to tell you in a minute because he says, and to esteem each other very highly in love, verse 13. Esteem, lead or to be a leader. Lead each other, he says, in love. Why? Why love? Well, now we're just about to crack this whole book open. Lead each other in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 13. He says, very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace amongst yourselves. And why? Why is that so important? Well, I'm going to read you something now which, will, which should completely make sense to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For brethren, you have been called unto freedom. We know that. Only use not your freedom for an occasion to serve the flesh, but by love serve one another. Right? Service. Remember, we said we're sons and daughters. It's free will. We want to do it. We want to serve each other in love. And he says, why love? He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, love. All the law is fulfilled in love. 
That's why Christ fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law because he gave himself freely out of love for you and me and love for his Father. That's why he fulfilled it. All the law that day, that covenant was taken away and began to wax old because of love. Love, serve one another, and he says in the end of verse 14, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. It's all about love. Why? Because God is love. God is love, isn't he? Incredible. So and after such amazing verses, right, for us to exhort or provoke the word, provoke there means to incite each other to love and to good works. By the way, he wants you to incite you to good works. Don't you remember Christ came to purge your conscience and save you from dead works? He says they're dead works. Exhort each other not unto that stuff. Exhort each other unto good works. And the good works are edifying, building each other up. They're the good things in life. They're the good things we need in ecclesia life. Right? They're the things that will remain forever because they are in Christ. That's what he wants us to do. He says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. After such amazing verses, after telling us and saying, let us do this and let us do that, he says, don't stop getting together. Do you know, young people, more and more frequently conversations are happening with people that don't come to the meeting anymore. I reckon I've had four or five with different conversations with people in the last month. They don't come along. Your age, some older. You're not stupid. You can look around your ecclesias. You can see people. Sometimes they fall away, don't they? They don't come anymore. And do you know what the funny thing is? You can sit down and talk to people and people will have 150 reasons as to why they don't come. You can talk to another one the next day and she might have 30 reasons and, and 20 reasons. And everyone says it's all so difficult. Do you know what? There's one reason. There's only one reason. Do you know what it is? People put faith in people. People will let you down all the time. There come a day when your ecclesia will let you down. You know why? Because it's just got people in it. And they're not perfect. They don't mean to do it. They don't mean to do it to you. But when it happens, you've got to remember they're just people. Do you know why it's important to remember that? Because the one that was perfect saves your life. So all of those things to do with just people, all they do is magnify what Christ came to do for us. The surefire way to give yourself a headache if Christ remains away in ecclesial life is to put people first before you put him. I want you to imagine if uh, someone give me a someone got a pen lid or something. Pen, perfect. Thanks. Pen. I want you to imagine <clears throat> your relationship with Christ as this. Right? So this is in the forefront of everything. This is what we've been trying to say to you. We want you to have a relationship with Christ front and centre in your life. Everywhere you turn, it's there. You view the world through that. This is your life, right? It said, this is your life. He is your life. So there you are and you go along. And so imagine you work out your own salvation, as the Bible says. You establish a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood, through his sacrifice. And you work out that this is amazing. I cannot believe I get to live forever for someone who gave himself for me, he didn't know me. And he created this opportunity that I might have access to God. And it is an amazing thing. And you've worked out your own salvation. You say, I believe this so much, I'm willing to give my life in type for it. And you're baptised, you kill the old man, you come out of the water and it is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And then one day you meet someone who thinks the same way as you. And they've got one of these as well. And you come along and say, hey, look at this. This is my relationship with Christ. Well, that's amazing, they say. And, and the other person says, well, do you know what? I've got one as well. Mine is slightly different, but do you know what? It's front and centre in my life. 
right? It's front and centre in my life, and I believe the basic same things, but do you know what? Christ is able to do different things for me than he's able to do for you in daily life. He's obviously able to save us all, but the way he inspires me in my life and the, and the lessons I take out of Scripture will be the different to you. So we're all slightly different, but do you know what? In this environment, we've all got it. And it's in the front and centre of your mind. You know when problems start? Problems start when you put this in your pocket. So do you know what? i still got a relationship with Christ, but it's no longer here. And now I'm looking around. You see, it's in my pocket, right? It's not right there. And I put him away every now and then. And I get annoyed with arranging brethren. Or I get annoyed with some other young person who said something about me on Facebook. Or I get annoyed because he says, you know what, you have to wear a tie. I don't want to wear a tie, you have to. And that annoys me. Why? And I start getting frustrated with people. And I start getting frustrated with environments. People in environment, they'll, they're both imperfect, they'll both let you down every time. But you forget that because Christ has been put in your pocket. And you forget. And he's away in here now. And so you start to, to, to get disheartened in your environment and in people. You ever thought how different it is when you put this up? Someone comes to you and says, you know what, you have to wear a tie, man. That's the way we do things, Randy. I want you to wear a tie. When this is here, it's completely different. Now, for me, if I don't want to wear one and I don't, have it, I don't feel I need to wear one, well, then I don't feel I need to wear one. But when I've got Christ in the middle, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of love, what do I say to myself? I look through this and I discern that this person, it is important to him that I wear one. And the Spirit of Christ says to me, well, if it's important to him, even though it's not important to me, I will make a sacrifice and just do it. Right? But if I take this away, it's just him and me. But when two people come together and they lay it out and they say, in this relationship that I have with Jesus Christ, I am prepared to sacrifice for you, my brother, and serve you in love. And in that moment, do you know what? You fulfill the law, every single bit of it. In that moment, you live Jesus Christ. Do you know that? You display the character of the Son of God in that moment. And that's all he wants from you. Because that's what God wants from you. And just like Jesus Christ, in that moment, you freely do his will. That's why we've got to keep this up here. We have to keep it in the forefront of our vision and in our minds all the time any time and never forsake the getting together of ourselves over trivial matters. It's not worth it. That sacrifice happens so we can be here tonight. We've got to hang on to it and never let it go. He says, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let me tell you, the day is fast approaching. Then he gives, in, from verse 26 <clears throat> through to 31, he gives a warning. He gives a warning to those that would leave. We won't spend much time on it, but he does say this. <clears throat> he says, For if we sin willfully under that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sins, sacrifice for sins. Simply put, if you choose that life, if you're going to choose that life and not the one that's been provided, God says, well, I can't help you because there's no more sacrifice for sins. That's it. One sacrifice once for all, forever. He says, that's it. If you don't want to accept the way that's been made for you, the way of the truth, the way of life that's been made for you, Christ is the way. If you don't want to accept that, there's no more sacrifices that are ever going to improve your position. It's a choice for us. And he gives the Hebrews, that warning, because they had chosen Christ. You ever look at this language here in verse 32? And this is a beautiful end of this chapter. Verse 32, he says, But call to remembrance the former days. The former days. You know what? In probably roughly the top writing of this letter, it was only 30 years before that Christ himself walked the earth. This ecclesia, this group of Hebrews, was old enough to remember Jesus himself. Perhaps some of them witnessed him. And in doing so, they've witnessed here the very substance of the law himself in the flesh. They've taken that on board. They believed. They got baptised. 
They've lived their life in the truth and now they're starting to fall away. And he says, I urge you, urgent appeal, I want you to remember those days. Remember the former days in which, he says, after you were illuminated. What a word. That is an awesome word in Scripture, illuminated. How do you turn a light bulb on? What else with a light bulb? You flick the switch. Where does it illuminate first? In the middle. In the middle. Electricity flows through and that element starts to heat up. Now, you can't tell because it happens instantly. You watch it in slow motion. The element starts to light up. It is darkness. Then as it slowly burns in you and burns in you, you get brighter and brighter and brighter until in the end, not only you can see, but everyone around you can see as well. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light of the world. We could all see it. Do you know the funny thing about illumination, if you want to talk about it like your faith, I don't know what it's like for you in your life, but in my life I've worked out this, this really horrible pattern. When times are good, I'm burning brightly. How does that help? Because I can already see in the daytime. Do you know what I mean? But then as time gets tougher and the light around you grows dim and suddenly you're in darkness, my illumination goes down as well. Uh, isn't the ideal the other way? The ideal is you burn really brightly in the dark time so you can see what you're doing. My life hasn't really worked like that, to be honest. I find it tough. I probably like you. Yeah, I hope, I, I think you like me. It's really hard when tough times come upon you to keep your faith burning brightly, to be illuminated. You know, it struck me the other night, though. Middle of the night, pitch black in our house. I had to get up to one of the kids. Pitch black. Now, I'm bound to, between now and a child's bedroom, like four bikes, 36 bits of Lego. I'm going to kill myself, pretty much, getting in there. I can't see a thing, so I need my light. To, I need to light the way. I can't turn on the big light because Chrissy's in bed and it will wake everyone up. So I just need the tiniest little bit of light to see what I'm doing. What do you reckon I went for? What's next to my bed? Huh? Phone. And what do you do? You don't open it and put your flashlight on because that's really bright as well. You just use the home screen, don't you? You do that at home. Everyone does that. So you press the button and the home screen lights up just a little bit. But do you know what? The darker the room, the greater that light is. And do you know what? In the end, if I hold it out here and try and cast light on my whole situation, there's not enough light there to do that. If I wanted to take stock of the whole room and get up there and put my phone up just with the light of the home screen trying to, to illuminate the whole thing, there's not enough light there. So I bring it a bit closer. It's still not quite working. So in the end, I end up with my phone down near my feet. And I can see where I'm going. The tiniest little bit of illumination. And I can see where I'm going. And you and I, you know what? The funny thing is, how many times when times get tough, do you try and shine a light on your whole situation? You sit there and you say to God, well, this is going wrong and that's going wrong and I'm not accepted there and I really don't like doing that and you've done this to me. The whole situation out and you're trying to show, shed light on it. Through the, and your faith is dimming. It's getting smaller and you're smaller and you're saying, give me a break here. Well, maybe he doesn't want you to see the whole situation at the time. You actually just need the tiniest bit of faith. That's what Christ said. Tiny little seed. You've got a long way to illuminate where we're going. He says, you have been illuminated. You endured he says in verse 32, a great fight of afflictions. Now you're finding out about the character of these Hebrews. These people were amazing. You're going to see in a minute how amazing these guys were. He says, partly while you were made a grazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you um, became companions of them that were so used. Do you know why Paul can confidently write about this? Because he was in charge of that affliction. Paul did this to them. There's every chance that he may have directly affected some of these people. The first century ecclesia had a lot of orphans in it because Paul killed their parents. So he knows all about it. And when he says, 
you uh, became companions of them that were so used, he would have seen it himself. As they dragged first century believers by their hair through the streets, people would spit on them and kick them, throw things at them. And then their brothers and sisters that would support them followed close by, stood there, their companions, while they were afflicted. Do you stand there and help someone when they're going through a tough time? Do you hear about it and know and give them a hand? Do you support them? Because this is the sort of people these Hebrews were. They were amazing to each other. They sacrificed for each other. In verse 34, he said, You had compassion on my bonds. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, the Hurim. I know Uncle Ron spoke about it at the start of the year, that thing where you get barred from the temple. Right? You get barred from the temple easily. The greatest shame you could ever suffer as a Jew was that. You were nobody. Dead to society. So much so people could come in, open your front door, and in full view, take whatever they wanted. Because you're nobody. He said, you suffered that. Because you've been illuminated and you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you were prepared to suffer that for his name's sake. Your possessions were taken. Why, he says... He says, why? Because knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Chapter 10, verse 1 said, for the law having a shadow. Chapter 10, verse 34 says, having in heaven a better and an enduring substance. The substance of the shadow resides in heaven at God's right hand. Do you remember we said, up there is real and down here is not. And they had that right because they knew that they were not saved by gold and silver and things that were corruptible, like 1 Peter 1 said, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were a purchased people. So much so they believed that, that they stood back while their earthly possessions, the things that could not save them, the corruptible things around them, were taken right in front of them. These people were amazing. He says, For yet ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Be patient, he says. That's his exhortation. Tonight, we, I want to close tonight with a story, I reckon one of the greatest stories in all of Scripture and easily one of the greatest moments of all history. It's my favourite, and it's in this story. It's in verse 34. We read it tonight. This sums up everything that not only we have talked about, but everything you've considered this year, young people. For ye had compassion. For ye had compassion. Do you know, if I have sympathy for you, it's best explained like this. If you, for example, if I break my arm, right, and it's in a cast, and you come up to me, and you've not broken your arm before, you can be sympathetic to me. You can be sympathetic because you know it would have hurt, but you've never broken your arm. So you don't really know what it's like, but you say, man, that must have hurt. Your arm's broken. If I break my arm, and you too, at some stage in your life, have also broken your arm, you can have empathy with me. You know why? Because you've lived that experience as well. Right? It's a shared experience. Hey, I broke my arm when I was little. You've just broken yours. I remember what that's like. To have compassion on someone is not only to sympathise with them, it's not only to empathise with their situation, having been through it themselves, but it is to have a burning desire to relieve that person of their suffering. That is what compassion is, to relieve them so that they don't actually have to go through it. If I had a choice, I would take that off of you, the suffering and the pain. I would not want you to break that bone. If I had a choice, I would have compassion on you. Compassion is the doing word, the verb, the doing word of love. And love fulfills the law. And do you know what? There's a story in the Bible to end our afternoon and evening together that pulls all this together, I invite you to turn over to Luke and at chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we begin at verse 25. 
And behold, it says, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Here we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb, come to take away the sins of the world. And he's surrounded by those that are learned in the law, that live their entire life by it, and none less in this occasion but a certain lawyer. It is actually a religious lawyer. So not only did this man know the law, he studied it all day. It was his religion. And he studied it and he stood up and tempting him, as they were so often wont to do in big groups, tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? Christ knew that he'd know the answer. Why? Because he studies the law. Because these guys lived it every single day. So he says, you tell me what's written in the law. How do you read the law? He says, well, answering, he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. There's your heart and mind, remember? Heart and mind. He says, I've got to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and thy neighbour as thyself. That's what I've got to do. Christ turns around and he says, verse 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do, and you will live. And there's the end of the story. So that very easily could have finished right there because the man knew the answer. He knew the answer. Do you know why he knew the answer? Because he'd been to school. He'd been to school. He'd been to the law. And the law was a schoolmaster. So the schoolmaster had taught him the theoretical answer for that question. The law says, I've got to love my neighbour as myself and love my God with all my heart, soul, strength and mind. That's what the law says I've got to do. And Jesus said, well, you're right, because the law does say that. But look what happens. Verse 29, but he, willing to justify himself, See, these guys lived a, a, a checklist life. So everything they did, they said, if I do, then I get. Right? So if I do this thing, then I get a reward of this. So he wants to justify his behaviour because in the morning, that's what they did. Must pray in public, must do this, got to drop $5 off over there, can't be seen to do this, iron all my shirts so I look the part walk around the block three times yelling really loudly. I've got to do all these things under the law so I look holy, right? So I look like I'm fulfilling the law. Oh, how do I get eternal life? I want to justify myself, he says. So he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Because if you tell me who neighbour is, I will go and find neighbour and I'll love him. I'll just look, at, I'll look around for him and I'll find him and I will love him. And then I get eternal life. You see, it wasn't in here, was it? It was all theory. He was living what he was taught during school, schoolmaster, but then he graduated and did nothing with it. So Jesus tells a story, and look who he uses. Jesus says, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. A certain man... The word certain, any, any man. This could be anyone, is what Jesus is saying in this story. Went from Jerusalem to Jericho, journeyed away from the holy city, right? He's journeying away. Already their ears would start to go up, everyone that's in the room. Why would he try and leave the holy city? And just any man, what's he talking about? And it says, and by chance, and by chance there came a certain Priest of all people, a priest came along. And it's by chance. Do you know what? The opportunity for you to exercise compassion and love and the character of Christ in your life will always happen by chance. You know why? Because it's the, the moment that you are at your most vulnerable, that you are at your most real. When you walk around the corner and you see something like this, this is Christ's point, you see something like this, Whatever's in here will come out in a second. God's designed it in such a way that by chance it will happen, you will come together, and in that moment, the real you, if Christ resides in you, that will come straight out. And if he doesn't, that'll come out as well, because look what he does. A certain man 
falls amongst the, the thieves. They leave him half dead. By chance, there came a certain priest. Remember the priest's job description? Do you remember? I'll find it for you. Hebrews, remember? Don't turn it up. Hebrews chapter 5. He says... Get it. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may both offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. We know that. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are also out of the way? This man is very definitely out of the way. It is this priest's job to have compassion on him. He has studied the law. He understands the theory. And by chance, God puts an opportunity in his life to exercise and act on what he knows. And what does he do? He says he passed by after seeing him on the other side. If there was one man in all of Israel that should have known what to do then, it's the priest. You begin to see why this law was never going to work. Do you know what? Never forget, young people, it is not about what you know because that man knew everything. It is all about what you do with what you know. It's what you do with what you know that counts. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at that place, remember, Christ, better than priests, better than Levites, And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. Do you know what the job was of the Levites? I'll read you their job description in Numbers uh, chapter 18. Have a listen. Verse 6, And behold, I have taken from among um, your brethren the Levites. I've taken them from among the children of Israel, it says. Numbers 18, verse 6, And he says, To you they are a gift for the Lord, uh, as a gift... for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. The Levites were the blue collar. The Levites helped you with what you watched earlier. When you brought your sacrifice in, they came and, they came and gave you a hand. They were God's gift to you to help with your sacrifices and with the running of the temple and the setting up and the pulling down. They were the blue collar guys. They were on the cold face of the job. Right? They got to know you as you brought your sacrifices. Right, And so along comes the Levite. He should know what to do in this situation. And when he was at that place, came and looked on him, it says, and passed by on the other side. He bothered to come over. He came over and there's like a half-naked person laying under a bush. And there's blood all on the ground. And he's curious. And he comes over and he looks and he lifts up and he sees. It's a man that's almost dead. And he looks up and down the road. And in that moment of chance for him to exercise what he knows in theory, he steps away and he's gone. And you say, well, how can that relate to me? Well, if you hear of someone going through a tough time, do you sit and observe their life like that? He was an observer. He knew what to do in theory, came along, didn't do it, but chose to stand there and have a bit of a look. You hear a rumour about someone, oh, I heard they're really struggling. Oh, really? Tell me more. Solomon says, you know what he says rumours are like? They're like really nice cake. You stick it in your mouth and it goes down, just throw it down into your belly and it tastes so good. You know why he describes it like cake? Because you want more. Oh, really? Tell me about it. I have no intention of helping that person with their problems, but I'm very happy to sit here and observe them for 10 minutes. Because that's what the Levite did. I've got no intention of helping you, but I'm just going to have a look. And then verse 33, but a Samaritan, not a priest, not a Levite, but a Samaritan, it says, as he journeyed. Do you know what these people thought of Samaritans? When they left Jerusalem to go that way, they would, they, they would rather go around a five or six day detour than pass through that city, pass through Samaria. They hated them. So the Lord Jesus Christ has used a priest as an example, a Levite as an example, no doubt surrounded by some of them. And now he says, a Samaritan. Their eyes like this, their ears pricking up now. What's he going to say next? He says, a Samaritan as he journeyed. Do you know what? 
Never, ever, ever look at someone and presume to know their journey. Never, ever look at someone and sum them up because they don't look like a priest or a Levite. Do you know what that verse tells you? We're all on a journey. You don't know this guy's story. You don't know where he's from. And you don't know where he goes after. But Christ says he was a Samaritan, so automatically he doesn't quite fit that Christadelphian bill, does he? And Jesus tells you he's on a journey. He works in everyone's life, different paces, different times and different places. And as he, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him... He had compassion on him. When he saw this individual, he had a burning desire to relieve that man of his suffering. Perhaps in his life he had gone through something similar. Either way, he didn't stop to observe. He didn't pass by on the other side. He saw that feet hanging out there and he ran to it. And he said, how can I relieve this man of the pain that he is going through? He saw and he had compassion or mercy or love for him and for his situation. And he says, and he went to him in verse 34 and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil, and it says, and, uh, and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he gave two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest when I come again, I will repay thee. This man saved that man's life by paying the price. One man paid the price. And do you know what? He said, I'm going to give you some more money for tomorrow as well. When I come back tomorrow, I will repay whatever's left. Do you know what? He paid the price for today and for tomorrow. When he picked that man up and took him to a place of refuge, Lord Jesus Christ has given us access to the place of refuge, that being the holy place, his father. And he paid the price, not just for today, but for tomorrow as well. And now you could hear a pin drop. As Jesus stood in front of these men. I can imagine him just looking around, scanning the crowd, and then with perhaps a soft face, looking back at the religious lawyer and now asking him the very question, he was asked. He says, Now which of these three think thou was neighbour unto him that fell amongst the thieves? And the religious lawyer's got nowhere to go. The homeless carpenter from Nazareth has done it again. And he said, He that showed mercy, he that showed compassion, he that lived and showed love. And Jesus said unto him, Go thou and do likewise. Young people, all of the law was fulfilled in that one word, that being love. We close our, uh, our day together with uh, a few words at the end of this verse. He says, for ye have need of patience, and after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. He says, for yet a little while, he that shall come will come. He is coming. Do you know who he's coming for? He's coming for you. Do you know who he's coming for? He's coming for me and my little family, for young families. He's coming for your parents. You know, he's coming for the oldies. Spare a thought for the oldies. There's been people that are baptised for 60 and 70 years waiting for him. You want to talk about hold fast. These people hold fast. Take strength for them. He's coming for them. And as we saw this week, he's coming for those that lay asleep now in his hope. And what better, who better to perhaps finish our day together than family? James was family. And James says this. Be patient, therefore, young people, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, 
and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. He says, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts and your minds. For the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another. Lest ye be judged. He says, behold, the judge stands at the door. 